Our message this morning, um, it's interesting because timing-wise, sometimes, you know, God brings a message into your life uh, when you're actually getting some wonderful opportunities for application, and uh, we'll kind of get into that a little bit, but uh, it's always nice when, when that occurs. But uh, Gordon MacDonald, in his book, Ordering Your Private World, this is something I read back in my college days, so that was a little while back, but finding it still pertinent to today. He says, if my private world is in order, it will be because I have chosen to press Sabbath peace into the rush and routine of my daily life. In order to find the rest, God prescribed for himself and all of humanity. He then proceeds to share a little story about William Wilberforce that many people may not know of. Many of us know that Wilberforce was a committed Christian and uh, was a member of the English Parliament, Parliament in the early 1800s. As a politician, he was noted for, again, his relentless leadership in convincing Parliament to pass the historical bill outlawing slavery in the British Empire, a feat that took almost 20 years. Wilberforce's spiritual strength and moral courage had to be consistent, had to be immense. We learn, though, something of the source of that strength and courage from an incident that occurred in 1801, some years before the anti-slavery bill was passed. Wilberforce, amid the battle over slavery, had become a prospect for another government position because the election of a new prime minister. By his own admission, he had what he called risings of ambition. And it was affecting his soul. It was affecting his heart. But there was a disciplined check and balance to Wilberforce's life. And in this situation, this routine became indispensable. And so his journal entry at the end of that week of being the, the potential of this position, he writes this. He says, blessed be to God for the day of rest and religious occupation wherein earthly things assume their true size. Ambition is stunted. Wilberforce's check and balance to a busy life was Sabbath. He had come to understand genuine rest. He had discovered that the person who established a block of time for Sabbath rest on a regular basis is most likely to keep all of life in proper perspective. That is, stepping back into the center where God is in full, full control. What struck me most about Wilberforce's testimony on Sabbath was that it just wasn't physical rest that was of help to him. It also helped him to keep all of life in perspective, which aids in one's emotional and mental health. I mean, can you imagine persevering through almost 20 years of trying to establish one law and the need to overcome who knows how many obstacles? In fact, I'm sure there were some people that wanted his life. You're going to need to have some life perspective to endure that. Now, let's step away for a moment from, Wilber from William Wilberforce and get a little personal. How is your life perspective at this point? Are there any routines that you have placed to help you step back into the center where God is in full control? Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the topic of Sabbath or rest. And to be honest, this has been a, a, an issue in my own personal life for some time now. Actually, probably since about the time of arriving, almost three years ago. In fact, uh, next week is my anniversary, three-year anniversary being here. What a blessing. So, and I, and I really mean this. Thank you for making it a blessing. You guys are great. And so... As, as I'm working through this in my own life, actually, it was COVID that uh, God really began to kind of get my attention when I got COVID and um, had some time to rest. <laughs> At times wondering, okay, am I going to survive? But resting. But, you know, it's in the midst of this, this time of, of, of wrestling with Sabbath, and we all kind of, we all can wrestle with this. We all know what life is like here in America. Uh, it's busy and sometimes crazy. But I have appreciated so much how Seth continues to take us back to Genesis. 
reminding us that God took Sabbath. He took a Sabbath. He took rest. And that we should too, and to our benefit. Seth also is, is emphasized that God is not trying to take something from us, but is actually giving us something that we need. It's how he's created us. He's created us for, for specific things in our life where we, where we step back and we rest. We take Sabbath. What God is too has shown us is that there's, there's a few routines or what some people call spiritual disciplines that can help us to regularly step back into that center where God is in full control and be reminded of that. So today we're going to look at Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. It's, we're right at the beginning of Mark's gospel, but we find already that Jesus is busy. But as we will look at his life just in this passage, briefly, we'll notice that like father, like son. And prior, prior to, to the passage we're going to look at in 29, we find him uh, in, uh, on the Sabbath in Capernaum. He's entered a synagogue. He's teaching. And while he's teaching, and again, a synagogue is very much like what we have here today. It's a gathering place. No sacrifices were offered at the synagogue. That was always still at the temple. So it was a place, local place, where they could sit and come together as, as, as believers and hear teaching. There was only one person oversaw the, the, the synagogue, the ruler of the synagogue, but he did not teach anything from Scripture. That was somebody else. So it's evident for Jesus to come in and start teaching. It's evident he's already established some form of reputation uh, as, as a result of being asked to teach. So he finds himself teaching, and then in the midst of that, he's confronted with a, a person of whom has an unclean spirit. And he then seeks to remove the spirit from this person, and people are in shock in light of, who is this that he has this type of authority? And so that's where we're at. But again, the emphasis is on the Sabbath. And that's where he's at. He's teaching. He's, he's ministering. But starting at verse 29, it says, and immediately, and you'll notice, if you ever read Mark, he likes that word immediately. He uses it a number of times. But he says, and immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Just a, I think what's really cool about that is we look at the prior story that led to this story, is that Jesus simply meets people, no, just normal, common people where they're at. He's not some kind of healer, you know, traveling healer with some kind of technique. But he was just simply coming alongside people where they're at, demonstrating authority and bringing healing and restoration where it deemed uh, necessary. And so that's where we're at. Right now, we're in uh, uh, Simon's, uh, with Simon's mother-in-law. She's being healed. She's healed, and then she, she begins to serve them. But in verse 32, it says, that evening at sundown, and it's interesting, he, he, they're making mention of sundown. The reason is, is that Sabbath then took place Friday night at sundown and would then end Saturday night at sundown. And so that was Sabbath. So, and, and so it says, and, and the evening, that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And so again, with regards to a Sabbath, they, the Jews were, they were forbidden to travel. They were forbidden to work on the Sabbath. So now at sundown, all of a sudden, word is spread about who Jesus is, what he's done at the synagogue. And now our, the whole neighborhood shows up at, at the Simon Peter, Peter's, Peter's uh, uh, mother-in-law's. And so now we have this, this situation where people are coming and now he's beginning this healing process. And isn't it fascinating that in the synagogue they're asking, who is this? But who is it that knows who he is? It's the demons. They know who he is. And he's telling them to be quiet and not to say anything. But here's, here's the verse that, that we'll be spending most of our time on after we finish reading this. But it says, 35, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark... He departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. That word desolate place is the same word that was used uh, for the wilderness that John preached. 
and where Jesus was tested. Mark records Jesus praying only three times in the gospel. And all occur while it is dark and in a solitary place. Here, and then following the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 6, and then at Gethsemane in chapter 14. So again, amid a whirlwind of activity, Jesus seeks to take time away by demonstrating total dependence on his Father. And we see this throughout, throughout, the, uh, throughout not only this gospel, but, uh, but others as well. We see that the, the, this work is not only just an outward work, but there's an inward work uh, as, as well. And so he's, he's quite an example here uh, in, in light of who he is, what he's doing, and what he's representing. Then finishing up, it says, And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Isn't it interesting? They're thinking, hey, we got, we're on a roll here. Let's, let's just keep this going. Let's keep this going. We got other people that you could see. Let's see them. And he's like, no, we got we to we go to the next place. It's evident he's trying, they're, they're not necessarily on the same page as he is right now in light of what his purpose and what he's a, about to do. But they'll, they'll eventually get there. But this is kind of where things are at right now. But it, it's, it's interesting too about him is that there's, there's, there, there's no sense of hurry. It's just, okay, we've, we've done some work here. I've got I've I've to go other places. There's other, there's other needs, there's other people that need to hear the message. And that Reading that caused me to kind of pause and ask myself a question. Has anything recently happened in my life where I came to realize that what I thought would be a priority for Jesus wasn't? And did it force me to kind of reorient uh, where my priorities need to lie? It's a good question to often think because sometimes we think we've got God figured out when in reality maybe we don't. And we need to step back into the center. And where God is in full control. And seek to get his perspective. So we see after walking through Mark chapter 1. Verses 29 through 39. It's obviously evident that Jesus is already a very busy man. And is heavily engaged in life and ministry opportunities. But considering our topic of Sabbath and rest. I want to spend the rest of the time just on verse 35 and look at what Jesus did in the midst of his busy life. You know, it's interesting that we, it's interesting that in, in Mark's gospel, we get introduced real quickly to, a, to some routines that, or spiritual discipline that Jesus has already, ha, he already has in his life. And I think it's a great example for us as well in regards to, again, that stepping back into the center and being reminded that God is in full control. Dallas Willard, in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, he makes this claim. He says, my central claim is that we can, we can become like Christ by doing one thing. By following him in the overall style of life he chose for himself. If we have faith in Christ, we must believe that he knew how to live. We can, through faith and grace, become like Christ by practicing the types of activities he engaged in. By arranging our whole lives around the activities he himself practiced in order to remain constantly at home in the fellowship of the Father. I love that quote. I've just been kind of reminiscing on that all week. So for a moment, let's just simply follow Jesus just looking at Mark chapter 1 verse 35. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And so I think one of the first routines we see in Jesus' life is that the routine of solitude. Our worlds are filled with noisy and busy schedules. Anyone disagree? <laughs> Maybe there's a retired person out there who's going, no, it's, it's fine, you know, so... I doubt it. And you know, that's the thing too. You think now with, 
with, with our phones and just the capability for music and podcasts and every, all this stuff. There's just so many things that are there just coming at us. I mean, even when we make a phone call, if we're put on hold, we're listening to music, right? I mean, last night I was at a, I was at a wedding and they, they had porta, they had actually a, kind of a trailer of bathrooms. And I'm going to the bathroom and there's music in there. And I'm like, well, I guess, okay. So, but again, this reminder that it's just everywhere. Advertisements. I mean, we, we, it's just, it just keeps coming at us. We have, we have become so accustomed to noise that we grow restless, restless without it. Do you think, now, be honest here. Do you think you could handle even an hour without saying anything or hearing a word from someone? Think about that. There's probably a few hunters out there probably could. Solitude is that, it's, it's that, it's that idea of just purposely abstaining from any interaction any contact with people, denying ourselves of, of that for, and, and, and any type of conscious interaction with anyone for a time just to stop, to step into that center and be reminded that God is in control. Again, Gordon McDonald, he shares a story about visiting a missionary center in Latin America where a sound studio for a radio station was being built. He observed the careful measures being taken to soundproof the rooms so that no noise from the city streets could mar the broadcasts and recordings that would come from that place. In relation to what he saw, he adds these observations. He says this, he says, Few of us can fully appreciate the terrible conspiracy of noise there is about us. Noise that denies the silence and solitude we need for this cultivation of what he calls the inner garden, that cultivation of our heart, our soul, our mind. He says, it would not be hard to believe that the arch enemy of God has conspired to surround us at every conceivable point in our lives with the interfering noises of civilization that, when left unmuffled, usually drown out the voice of God. He who walks with God will tell you plainly, God does not ordinarily shout to make himself heard. As Elijah discovered, God tends to whisper in the garden. I can remember, you know, when Laura and I were first married, we were on staff at Camp Crusade for Christ, now crew. And uh, Laura was, a, she liked to sleep in. And uh, I've never really been one to sleep in. So she could have her quiet times kind of at her leisure. Well, then Anna showed up. <laughs> and then 361 days later, Emily showed up. What is solitude now for a young mom? And some of you young moms are up there going, uh-huh, yeah. And, and those who have been there and done that are going, yeah, yeah, I remember those days. She reached a point and she realized that if she was going to have solitude in her life, if she was going to build this into it, she had to get up early. She had to get up before the babies got up. And that's something that she began to instill. And now we don't have any babies in our house, but she still has that. She has that solitude. Now, she has introduced a hot tub to that solitude. I think she's really enjoying that. So, but, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, it's one of those things where she recognized that it's just not going to happen. I've got to somehow figure out put, how to put this in for, for not only for her own spiritual health, but she knew for her emotional and mental health as well. Even to this day, she knows when it's time, I've got to, I've got to get some time down time alone. And uh, providing that. You know, and sometimes, you know, we realize that things are kind of crazy. But sometimes it's just a matter of just being a little creative. It could just be simply driving in your car. Lots of times the radio is on or we've got our phone doing something. Sometimes it's just no noise and just being at peace. Again, getting, stepping back into that center. And just, and it oftentimes it does. I mean, Viktor Frankl, I came across a story this week where he was in a concentration camp. 
Not an easy, not a, a, a place that were, were to find solitude. But he said there was one little spot where something had been built for some reason. And now there was dead bodies that were laying beside it because he said there was about 12 a day that were dying. But he said, you could just kind of sneak in there. And he said, I, I could get five minutes of just solitude. But the nice thing is where I was at, he says, I could look beyond the fence and I could see just beautiful countryside. But in the midst of that chaos that he was in, in the midst of the, just the smell of death and everything else, it was his stepping back into the center, in spite of what he was going through, to remind himself that God is still in control. I myself, I enjoy taking walks. Uh, I sit very long and I fall asleep. So taking a walk is what's helpful for me. And uh, that's one of the things that I, that I like to try and do. But Think about your, your routine. Think about your schedule and ask yourself, where could I place some solitude in my life? Because, again, we need some routines. We need some disciplines that will help us to regularly step, step back into the center and remind us that God is in control. So we have the routine of solitude. He, he went off to a desolate place. But then it says he prayed. As mentioned earlier, Mark records Jesus praying just three times in Mark. But if you look at the Gospels overall, there's 17 more times where it's referenced where he breaks away for solitude. He breaks away for prayer. It becomes quite evident that solitude and prayer were a normal routine or discipline in the life of Christ. Whether it be praying just before his disciples, whether it be praying after the death of John the Baptist, or uh, um, uh, praying as, as, as we find here in, this, in, in ministry. But, you know, think about that. Think about that. Jesus, fully God, fully man. Again, fully God, fully man. He has built these types of disciplines in his own life. He has. Jesus. He's built them in. So, again, we're being reminded that as God established the Sabbath for himself, there's reasons why we need Sabbath in our own life. And so it begs the question, how about us? How about us? A number of years ago, I was reading a book called The God You Can Know by Dan DeHaan. It's an older book. I'm not even sure if it's still in print. But I came across this quote by George McDonald, not Gordon, George McDonald. And it stuck with me to this day with regards to prayer. Because oftentimes when we think prayer, we think I need to have something. I have to be able to, I have to go to God with something. There's something I need. I, I need. I need this. I need this. I need this. I need this. But I appreciated McDonald's, his perspective. He says, but if God is so good as you represent him, and if he knows all that we need, and better far than we do ourselves, why should it be necessary to ask him for anything? I answer, what if he knows prayer to be the thing we need first and most? What if the main object in God's idea of prayer to be the supplying of our great, our endless need, the need of himself? I've never forgotten that. He says, Hungry, hunger may drive the runaway child home, and he may or may not be fed at once, but he needs his mother more than his dinner. Communion with God is the one need of the soul beyond all other needs. Prayer is the beginning of that communion. And some need is the motive of that prayer. So begins a communion. A talking with God. A coming to one with him. Which is the sole end of prayer. Yea, of existence itself in its infinite phases. We must ask that we may receive but that we should receive what we ask in respect of our lower needs is not God's end in making us pray. For he could give us everything without that. To bring his child to his knee, God withholds that man may ask. What if the main object in God's idea of prayer be the supplying of our great, our endless need the need of himself. Isn't that fascinating? That he wants communion with us. That he wants a relationship with us. That he, he, 
And so that's where, that's where we, we begin to learn the, that, that practicing the presence of God and just being aware that I can communicate with my Father at any moment, any time. And it's just a means of just coming to Him. Again, going back to a busy mother, how do you do that? <laughs> and maybe you're familiar with this story, but Susanna Wesley, she's the mother of John and Charles Wesley. She delivered 19 children. Ten of them survived. But she was very dependent on prayer. She was known for sitting in her chair for two hours a day with her kitchen apron pulled over her head while the ten children read, studied, and played around her. The children knew that if the apron was up, you don't bother mommy. I don't know, you can try it, ladies, and see, see how it goes, but uh, we'll see, see how it works. But it's evident she had built this discipline in her life. She knew, I'm sure, with that many children, I'm sure she knew, I, I need something outside myself, and she was trusting God with that. You know, we, we all, you know, that's the question, you know, people ask, how's your prayer life? That's the way to humble any Christian. But if we could just get back to that idea that it's not about doing something, it's about a relationship we're in a relationship with the God of the universe who says, come, come to me and, and, and be with me. S sit at my feet and let's talk. Come back to the center and be reminded that I'm in control. So again, a few routines and spiritual disciplines that can help us step back in the middle. And then finally, one that necessary doesn't necessarily stand out in the text, but I think it reflects. It's this routine of slowing down. That is a difficult one for us as Americans. We can see in chapter 1 from the get-go that Jesus' is ministry, that he often has much to do. But we see with his, his routine of solitude and prayer that, that it's, never, it's never severed the connection between him and his father. And his ability to demonstrate and show love when it was called for. Yes, Je Jesus was a busy man, but he was never hurried. John Ortberg, Ortberg, in his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, shares a story about his own life when he learned the lesson about living an unhurried life. He had recently moved to a new location and entered a new ministry position. He called a wise friend to ask for some spiritual direction. He described the pace of, at which things were moving in his current setting. He told him about the rhythms of his family life and about the present condition of his heart as best he could discern. What did he need to do, he asked, to be spiritually healthy? What do I need to do to be spiritually healthy? So after John asked that question, there was a long pause. And then the answer. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Another long pause. Okay, okay, I've written that down, John said. I, I, and I told him that a little impatiently. That's a good one. Now, what else is there? He, John goes on, he says, I had many things to do. And this was a long-distance conversation, so I was anxious to cram in as many units of spiritual wisdom into the least amount of time possible. <laughs> Another long pause. There is nothing else. He is the wisest spiritual mentor I have ever known. And from an immense quiver of spiritual sagacity, he drew only one arrow. There is nothing else. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And it's at this point in the book where John pivots. He pivots from his own story and he pivots to his reader. And he says this. Imagine for a moment that someone gave you this prescription with the warning that your life depends on it. Consider the possibility that perhaps your life does depend on it. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. Hurry can destroy your souls. Hurry can keep us from living well. That is keeping us from the center Again and again, as we pursue spiritual life, we must do battle with hurry. 
For many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them. Ouch. Coming across that this week, that was a, that was a time for pause. It really was for me. And, uh, and, I, and at the same time, I sense that I know God is doing something in my life in this area. Because I've seen a few things in my life where, <laughs> and someone pointed this out. And some of you, some of you, probably some of you guys recognize this, is you're coming up at a stoplight and you're looking for which car is the slowest. Because I want to get in the other lane. You know, uh-huh, that's what I thought. You guys know. So one of the challenges was just stay in the lane and don't move. And, you know, it's, it's an indication that, yes, I have, I've, been, I've been conditioned by my culture. There's nothing wrong, with, you know, about being efficient and trying to do this and do that. But there's at times when you realize that, you know, there's, there's probably something kind of wrong with me. That, that hurry, it is a distraction. And I need to be really careful. And so I kind of challenge you to kind of stop and consider that. Kind of where, where are you at? Do you, do you feel that hurry? Do you, do you have children? You know what that's like. That can be pretty tough. It can give, cause a lot of frustration, especially if you're trying to get to church on time. But yeah, give that some thought. Where is hurry? Ask the Holy Spirit to begin to open your eyes to, to where there might be hurry in your life that could be a distraction and could be squelching your spiritual life and your growth and your time with the Lord. You know, is your time with the Lord in a hurry? You know, I got to get, get through four chapters and then I move on. But is there any time to think and reflect upon what God is doing? And again, a few routines, spiritual disciplines that can help us regularly step back into the center where God is in full control. Again, this week, I was challenged with this about every day. I was trying to work on this message. And sometimes working on a message in the midst of all, everything else I'm doing, sometimes it could be really challenging. And so, like I said, I like to walk. I like to, I like to take prayer walks. And I've been coming in this week, and there's this, Matt, you need to get into the office, and you need to start working on your message. You, know, you need to be spending more time on it. And yet there was another side of me that was saying, no, you need some time to step back into the center. And so in the mornings, it, it was sometimes it would take me a, a, a lot of, walk, you know, maybe a quarter mile walking just to ask God to just settle my spirit and allow me to kind of get engaged. And again, put it in his hands. Learning to cast my cares on him. Trusting him with the message, with the time spent with him that he would, he would somehow maybe possibly multiply that, mess, multiply that time when I did spend time in it. And he did. And I'm, very, and I'm very grateful for that. But again, reflecting upon and kind of wrapping up, I go back to that first quote from Gordon MacDonald. If my private world is in order, it will be because I have chosen to press Sabbath peace into the rush and routine of my daily life in order to find the rest God prescribed for himself and all humanity. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the example that you set right from the get-go in Genesis. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've demonstrated what a busy, busy life can be. And yet, even more so, you demonstrated what still needs to be a priority. And that is our relationship with God. Our relationship with you. Thank you for reminding us the importance of pausing. Of looking for places of solitude. Taking opportunities to pray. 
Indeed, Lord God, unhurrying our lives to simply put ourselves in the center and be reminded that you are God, that you love us, that you are committed to us, that you care for us, and that you are in control. Lord, I pray that as we go forth this week that we would, again, take that time, begin to build these routines in our life, knowing that it, it, it's not only going to benefit us and, and benefit our walks with you, but, Lord God, it has the potential of benefiting our, our marriages, our, our families, Lord God, our church. So, Lord, again, we just, we just offer ourselves to you and pray, Lord God, that you would help us in this. And, Lord God, remind us that it's a relationship that you want with us. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.